to PHO 140, the history of photography. This is going to be our first online lecture, so hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any feedback, just let me know. Um, send me an email, make a comment, um, and we'll be sure to kind of integrate that into these online lectures. So first and foremost, uh, the thing that I want you guys to take away from this class, if we just sum it all up in one simple sentence, it is this, that photographers are omnivores. Photographers are omnivores. Basically what that means is that photographers really have to consume everything for inspiration, um, for what they do, and photography has always really been a kind of cross-discipline. It's been used from everything from artistic expression to record keeping and genealogies. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Helen Levitt had this great quote. Uh, she was a great photographer and she said, everything I have ever seen has influenced me. So I want you guys to hold on to that as we go through this class to remember that photographers are omnivores and really every single thing you see every day should be inspiring you uh, to do something greater. So um, the first thing, this is a history of photography class. So let's start at the beginning. What does photography mean? So photography literally means light writing. Photo is light. Graphy is writing, light writing. So this name was given to it um, around 1839. And at this time, there were really just three basic kinds of photography. And now it's grown so that photography is kind of this broad gamut uh, of all kinds of different things that we'll talk about as we go through. Um, photography didn't start in the digital form that we know it today, uh, but it's still... Uh, interacted with light. Still we work with light. We use light meters. Uh, the cameras are capturing that light. Um, and so it's kept that name of light writing photography. Uh, it's possible that the true kind of history of invention of photography will never be known. Uh, we can pick out certain individuals, but it kind of happened organically at the same time in a bunch of different places. Um, by 1839, uh, kind of after the medium of photography had started to catch on, the industrial worlds really started to use it uh, and see what they could explore and see how it could be used. And around 10 years later, inventors and photographers uh, began to develop a photography industry. Um, it led to a huge market, portraits were created, uh, and kind of a surge in photography being used in personal expression. But We'll talk about that more in the future. Uh, let's hop back to the very beginning, a very good place to start with the origins of photography. So even before photography, uh, there were some devices and kind of contraptions that people had made that would help the human eye to produce an appearance of an optical reality. Really that's what photography is about. It's about capturing a optical reality that we see and kind of locking that into time. So photography was presented to the world on August 19th, 1839. You, uh, and it was uh, presented at the Academy of Sciences and the Academy of Fine Arts in Paris. Uh, what's interesting about this is the actual inventor was sick. So he had to send um, one of his assistants. Uh, and the actual inventor that we need to know is Jacques Darure. Uh, you can see his name down there, D-A-G-U-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, Jacques Daguerre. Uh, he is in the really inventor of photography or is credited with one of the inventions of photography. Um, and his work was so influential that he was given a lifelong pension uh, by the government for his invention. But he only got the money if he would disclose the entire method that he used to create uh, this way to capture the world outside. So... He wrote a book called The History and Description of the Process of the Daguerreotype and the Diorama, uh, and he sold it uh, and made a ton of money. So this book set off a frenzy with new invention uh, that people wanted to create things and wanted to create this new photo uh, that Daguerre had in this process that he had created. Uh, this book was translated into a ton of different languages and really published all over the world. So let's go back just a little bit about why we needed photography. So during the late 1700s, the world was very rural. 
there wasn't a lot of mass culture. Um, and there wasn't really a hunger uh, to keep realistic images. But in the early 1830s, uh, things started to change. People wanted to capture the world around them. And a lot of artists really wanted to capture the reality that surrounded them. So most of them did this in the style of painting. Uh, it was just kind of the most common thing and the easiest thing to do before photography came on the scene. Um, in the years before photography, there wasn't really any focus on imaginative art. One of the most common uses of art uh, was to just copy the observable and real world. So if I look out the window and I see a tree, I'm painting the tree. Uh, it wasn't something that wanted to be fantastical. Uh, a lot of artists would kind of use different inventions to create their images, but none that had really come to photography. Um, one of the more notable ones was invented by uh, Abraham Boss, and he created a screen of equally spaced squares to really uh, uh, help with the appearance of perspective. So it's basically a whole bunch of little squares, and he would use this as he was drawing uh, to create like a portrait of a person, and that is commonly known today as graph paper. So he pretty much invented graph paper. Paper. Um, <clears throat> silhouettes were really the most um, influential, most used kind of quote unquote photography uh, of the time. And this was before really the camera was invented and the process of photography was invented. Um, but it was still light painting uh, or light writing. So silhouettes were partially used for entertainment, partially used for art. And the silhouette portrait became available to really any person of any class. So everyone wanted him, uh, wanted them. Artists would sometimes cut paper into the profile of the subject. And what they would do is they would set up a candle and this candle would uh, show kind of the silhouette or the shadow of the person's face. And then they would draw that face on the other side. What's in interesting about this is almost everyone wanted a silhouette. Silhouettes really became something that gave each person a sense of individualism. Regardless of their class or race, they were wildly popular uh, among professionals and business people, and the likenesses were sometimes changed to show level of importance. Let's say that you were very rich and snobby. They would maybe put your nose a little higher up, or they would put your chin out, um, or they would change your facial features so that when you gave a silhouette to a friend or you had it displayed in your house, it was something that presented your family well uh, and something that would present yourself as kind of a higher class than you may have been. So the next thing uh, that actually is at the California Museum of Photography in downtown Riverside uh, is something called a camera obscura. Now, this is a drawing aid, uh, really a photography, a light writing aid, just like we talked about uh, kind of the silhouette and the graph paper um, kind of invention. The camera obscura was another aid. Uh, what a camera obscura is, is basically means dark room. It was a darkened kind of room sized chamber where one tiny opening in the wall would act as a lens. It would bring in the light from outside and show the scene outside on the opposite wall in reverse. So if you get a chance, uh, head down and you can see what that actually looks like in person and it's absolutely amazing. Uh, here is a great uh, diagram showing that it's basically a dark box. There would be a lens on one side and that lens would push through the light, capture it, and then reflect it up so that the artist could draw whatever that scene was that was happening on the other side of the lens. Uh, there was another invention called the camera lucida. So camera obscura is a dark room. Camera lucida is a light room. Uh, a light room is very much uh, smaller. It's basically a prism of glass that has two silver plates inside. What that would do is it would reflect whatever it was aimed at so that the artist could look through it and use that light capture to then recreate this image uh, by hand that they were seeing on the other side. So let's talk a little bit about uh, another invention of photography. As we said, it was invented by a bunch of people kind of at the same time simultaneously. So uh, one of the people we'll need to talk about is Antoine Florence. So Antoine Florence traveled a lot. Uh, he went through Brazil uh, and around the world to kind of capture people, do some ethnographic research. Uh, and he would paint these beautiful, beautiful views and paint portraits of the people that he had met. Well, in 1830, he was trying to publish a book. 
and he got really, really frustrated by the lack of kind of nearby printing shops, so he decided to invent his own printing technique. He called it polygraphy. Polygraphy, again, we know that graphy means writing, so poly means multiple, so it's multiple writing. So soon after inventing this polygraphy so he could make copies of the book, he kind of accidentally invented photography. Um, he would notice that certain fabrics that he was using would fade when exposed to light, so you'd have kind of tonal, uh, tonal differences. So he started to experiment with a camera obscura and exposing it to light, um, and really experimenting with what can we do with these fabrics to capture an image when they are exposed to light. So in 1832, he started using the term photography, uh, changing multiple writing to light writing. So when Daguerre, that we talked about before, that really kind of was one of the forefathers of inventing photography, um, announced in 1839 that he had this process, he published his book, started getting money, Florence kind of realized that his process couldn't compete with the quality of what Daguerre had come up with and the process that was in the book that so clearly showed how to do it. Um, he gave up on any further real uh, tries at printing business, uh, and he really said, I'm not saying that I want to dispute this. It's not that I invented it. It's not that someone else invented it. I don't believe that two people can't have the same idea. So he thought, you know what? I think people can. two people can have the same idea, and maybe photography was just invented at the same time by two different people. So it's possible that the history of the invention of photography will never be fully known just because of the way it came about. But we can definitely pick out certain individuals uh, that were working uh, in great, great styles. Another one of those individuals uh, is uh, Joseph Niepce. So Joseph Niepce um, invented a style called sun writing. What sun writing was uh, is... Uh, Actually, we'll talk about that process in just a second. So, uh, Niepce was working uh, in a process that used lithography. Lithography was really perfected in 1790s, uh, 1800s, um, and it used a technique that would kind of reproduce images uh, using drawing on a flat surface as opposed to engraving into a stone or something. So. Niepce uh, couldn't draw well on the stone, so he began to experiment with ways to produce an image through the action of light-sensitive materials. He developed a process that would create a negative of an image. Now, a negative, you'll need to know this, uh, is an image where the light has become dark and the dark has become light. It's basically the opposite um, of what we see in the photo. So Niepce tried to use this negative to then create a positive image, but couldn't quite figure it out. Um, his experiment in, experimentation and research uh, was often kind of independent from what everyone else was doing. So starting in 1822, Niepce started to shift his interest from copying engravings by using light. Uh, he started creating a process that would leave a kind of engraving plate uh, and expose light to it to create further copies of a print. Um, Niepce kind of would take this image, expose it to iodine, and it would reverse the image and create a kind of greater contrast. Now this was called a direct positive. What that means is that it was a photo that would no longer be a negative. It was a direct positive. So it was capturing what they were seeing by using light. Uh, because there was no real negative, it would turn into the positive. Niepce, um, kind of invented uh, this form of photography and, <coughs> excuse me, I had a little cold. Uh, in 1826, Niepce took a photo um, called the Window at Gra, and it was known as the world's first permanent photograph because it was an absolute direct positive. So we talked about Niepce kind of creating these awesome, uh, really the first photograph using this process of uh, creating a direct positive. Uh, but Daguerre and Niepce actually started to work together a little bit. Um, Daguerre started to experiment with Niepce's materials and process, um, and this led to the creation of a latent image. Uh, so what that means is that a latent image 
had been uh, registered onto a silver surface, so exposed to light, but you couldn't see it yet. Uh, almost like a pre-developed film. So when Nipsey started with a visual image uh, and intensified the tones, Daggery discovered that there was an invisible image that could be developed with mercury to make it visible. So instead of trying to capture exactly what they're seeing with the latent image uh, in the kind of light capture that Nipsey was using, Daggery realized there's something here that if we expose it with mercury will show us a better image. Uh, Dagger's process was so simple that he thought someone else was going to steal it. He just said, this is pretty much what everyone else is doing, but you just use mercury to expose it, and it creates this beautiful, beautiful rendition of what's happening with the light. So he termed it uh, into a specific term called the daguerreotype. Uh, it was his own adapted process to create a visible image and it would only need four or five minutes to process instead of uh, possible hours on Nipsey's process. Um, while still using parts of Nipsey's process, Daggery demanded that he would have the right to call himself the sole inventor of the process and name it after himself. Uh, so he kind of took part of Nipsey's process, said, hey, this is going to be my thing now, and we're going to name it after me. And so the daguerreotype was born. The daguerreotype was released in France and became wildly popular around the world. Uh, and as word spread, a lot of inventors and scientists tried to recreate their own versions of photography. So Daguerre's process was extremely popular. And after presentations uh, of his the way that he created it, it became even more popular. But the real possibilities for photography to emerge really took about 15 years for it to kind of catch on. Uh, photography was really experimental uh, and evolved in art. Uh, it wasn't solely for science and actual reality. Uh, a lot of photographers became focused on assembling series of photographs that showed celebrities or cultural figures um, based on entertainment. Uh, Daguerre eventually received a patent that restricted the making of daguerreotypes only to those in Britain who were able to pay for the process. So Daguerre stole part of Nipsey's process uh, that he was working on him with, named it after himself, and then made it illegal to use the process unless you paid him for using his process. Um, in 18... 39, the New Yorker published an article that said that the daguerreotype would basically replace all other kinds of art. Uh, the, the daguerreotype would replace painters, engravers, uh, sketchers, and kind of change the world as we know it, which it did. So the daguerreotype was primarily adopted um, when creating renderings in portraiture and science. The daguerreotype was very, very clean, uh, very, very precise, and had a very, very sharp focus. Um, as you can see here. So this would be an example of a daguerreotype, one of the more famous ones of Edgar Allan Poe. And reactions to early photography uh, were very varied. A lot of people were confused and kind of timid of photography. Um, in 1849, Edgar Allan Poe had this picture taken, uh, and he said that the daguerreotype and photography was a perfectly, uh, positively perfect mirror. Um, the rapid growth of photography led to a huge explosion um, in portraiture. Uh, a lot of people wanted to get their picture taken, have a picture of themselves, much like they wanted to have a silhouette, and they now wanted a picture. So. A portrait was not seen as just a picture, it was more of a social and visual description that could kind of sum up strangers quickly. The idea is that they could convey the manner of whoever was sitting in front of the camera forever. You could capture a moment in time, capture yourself, and present yourself in that way regardless of what was happening uh, anywhere else in life. So keeping on portraiture, uh, there was a wide range of kind of photographic practice that started to develop rapidly uh, in the early years. Uh, even though people were using photography for other things, 
photography never caught on in this time, uh, except for in portraiture. Portraiture was huge after the invention of photography. The earliest daguerreotypes um, really took a long time to expose, so the sitters had to be extremely still. If they moved, it would lead to blurred images. Uh, that's why a lot of times you don't see people smiling in photos. They seem very proper, um, very stiff, because they had to stand so still that uh, because if they moved, it would create a blurry image. Um, they would often have this kind of wide eye, rigid stance uh, that, we, that we talked about. Uh, and the modern smile really didn't become a part of the portrait until much later on. As exposure time shortened, uh, devices were still invented to hold heads still. Uh, what that would be, as you can see here on the right, it would be something that you would put your head in that would hold your head still so that you could take a photo so it wouldn't be blurry uh, on your face. Uh, the early daguerreotype portraits were often uh, very rigidly um, kind of frontal. So it would just be your portrait, uh, straight on, it was never kind of an artistic way of presenting photography. Uh, it was something that was very, very rigid and very, very record keeping. It was a sign of social status that people wanted to have. Um, in 1841, uh, Richard Beard opened the first licensed public daguerreotype studio. Uh, and what that means is it was the first place that people could come to a establishment, sit down and say, hey, this establishment exists only to get your picture taken, to give you a daguerreotype of your family, to give you something that you can take home uh, and take uh, as a status symbol to everyone else you know. Shortly after that, a man by the name of Jean Claudette uh, opened his own studio and he deemed it a temple to photography. Uh, it was decorated and would often have a lot of props, backgrounds, uh, and his sitters would kind of be arranged in a specific way so they could show that higher level of um, means, higher level of uh, social status. So the photography studio emerged on a new kind of social space to where sitters would create what they wanted the world to see. So photography had already changed from just capturing what was outside the window to trying to have that illusion of, we're not going to show you what we see. We want to show you what we want you to see, uh, which is what photography has moved to a lot today. So that's going to be all we talk about for the first lecture. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And if you have any feedback or questions, feel free to see, send me an email. Thanks so much for watching.